join us for the webinar um, on Catholic social teaching, our latest endow study that uh, we've been working on for more than a year and are absolutely thrilled to finally present it officially and formally in this format to our endow community. Um, we are very excited about this study. I personally am so excited about this study because uh, prior to reading it, I thought I knew a lot about Catholic social teaching and then going through the study and particularly in the format that it's presented, uh, I have learned so much and have uh, grown in my understanding, not just of what Catholic social teaching is, but what it means and what impact it can have if we really understand it. And just to wet your whistle a little bit about what we're all going to experience together, I wanna to share some of the comments um, that we've received about the study from people who have, who have reviewed it. Um, Father Tony Caballero was the censor who reviewed it for the imprimatur, and he said it's very original and will help many women. And then Helen Alvary, who some of you may know um, or have heard of because of Women Speak for Themselves, is a professor at law at George Mason University. And she said about the study, I love the historical approach. Other approaches have been done ad nauseum, the four themes, the seven principles, but tying the times to the docs and themes allows for remembering them for real. And then Barbara McGeegan from EWTN said, uh, you have a real masterpiece here, just in time to save the world from chaos. It is a pearl of great price. So we are so excited um, to share this study with all of you. And um, in particular, there is a sentence um, in the prologue of the study, which actually, actually comes right before chapter one, which gives a little bit of um, the goal of going through this study together. And um, we write that our hope with this study is to ignite in each one of us a vision for healing a broken world beginning in our own hearts and families. When we move outward from this place with the church's writings and doctrine as guide, we will be instruments of God's peace, a light to the nations. So that is really what we're hoping that you will get out of participating in this webinar and about reading this study. And we are so excited to begin this journey of discovery of Catholic social teaching um, together. So with that as a brief introduction, I will turn it over to Teresa Hodgins, our longtime Endow host, Endow writer, Endow um, participant, and she is going to lead us in our study for the next eight weeks. Teresa. Thank you, Annette. Um, welcome again to everyone. I am so excited also to be sharing this with you. Um, I'm, a, I'm a moral theology geek, and so Catholic social teaching is kind of what I do a little bit. There are other things too, but or what I did before I started having children. Um, <laughs> I hope, and with your prayers, that I'll be able to make it through the whole study. I'm currently 33 weeks pregnant, and so we're like cutting it close. But um, I'm just going to share that now so that you know that one day Laura may take over for me as the host, but I'll be back. Um, this is so much fun for me that I was like, of course I can do it. It'll be fine. It's a couple hours a week. It's a break. It's kind of the break that I've always taken um, as my, or for kind of me to be, to keep up with my theology geekiness while also being just a mom, um, not just a mom, being a mom. But the first thing I also wanted to do was point you to that prologue, because as many of you probably know, um, we didn't schedule enough time. It's too hard to do a two hour Zoom meeting, um, but a classic endow format would take a two hour, would take two hours. It would take two hours to read through and discuss this chapter in depth and give it the time that it needs. So today we, and for the next eight weeks, I'll be selecting two sections from each chapter um, to read and discuss. So today it'll be sections one and three. Um, hopefully you were all able to get the download of the chapter off of the website. Um, and that 
it will entice you then to buy the rest of the book. Um, we do, um, I will be putting the, the reading up, but you're missing out if you miss that section that we don't read, because it's always so hard for me to decide which section it is that we don't get to read, and today was no different. Um, so I do kind of just want to really encourage you to buy the book, take notes, mark it up, make it yours, um, and kind of just stick with us on this journey as we, um, as we go through history with Catholic social teaching. As they mentioned, as Annette mentioned, it's a historical approach to Catholic social teaching. So we are starting with, uh, we're starting with Genesis, um, starting with the beginning of time and going all the way until the present time. So it is a very fast journey um, to do in eight weeks, but it will be, I think, I mean, it's, it's a good journey. <laughs> um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and show you a little bit of that prologue that we, um, that was written that's part of the chapter one download, but not something we're going to read the whole of today. Um, but I do just want to point your attention to it um, because it does sort of frame and um, set the tone for and explain kind of why we took the approach that we did. Laura Zambrana, I'm so excited she's joining us today because she had such a, a huge hand in putting this study together um, and directing it the way that it went, um, that her insight will be invaluable. Um, our director of content is what is her official title. Um, she'll get to introduce herself in just a minute. But what I wanted to point to you is to say, um today that this kind of this study isn't meant just to stay in a book and that we really meant um to point out this idea that catholic social teaching is a call to action and meant to activate your feminine genius in light of history and the current needs of the world our world needs you and again like it sounds a little cheesy when i read that aloud but also true, like it does need you. God made you because he needed you to fill, fill a mission in the world. Um, and that Catholic social teaching can help us to, to fulfill that mission, help our understanding of what we are meant to do in the world. Um, and that we as women are called to influence the world in a unique way. So hopefully you get a chance to read the rest of that prologue. Um, before we jump in uh, to the rest uh, or to reading, I just wanted to set up a little bit of preliminary um, kind of how things are going to work um, for anyone who's joining us new. Um, we're kind of doing this in a classic, what we call a classic and DAO format, which is that our studies are meant to be read aloud. And so we as a panel will be reading the sections we'll discuss aloud. Uh, and then spending some time on the discussion questions, discussing them. Unfortunately, it's hard to include 300 people in a, in a Zoom discussion um, as much as we would like to, but uh, we're gonna do our best by opening up the chat box. We'll be open throughout the seminar. Um, if you have questions, please direct them to um, our tech guru, Kelsey, who is behind the endow name. Um, so direct them to endow as um, Kelsey is there to answer any sort of questions, technical or otherwise. Um, and she will also be passing sort of the content related questions on to me, which we will then try to get to um, after we read through the second section and discuss. At that time, so sort of after about, so I'm on the East Coast, um, so it's after one o'clock for me. Um, we'll have time uh, also if you want to raise your hand and pose a question verbally, um, we would love to hear from you that way too. And we'll try to answer those questions as they come through and then also anything that comes through on the chat box. So hopefully in that way, we can kind of include more of you than just the five of us. But um, that should give you a general idea of kind of how things will go today. I do want to make just a brief mention that 
our webinars are free to participate, um, but they're not free to produce. Uh, and so we would greatly appreciate your buying the book. Um, we don't require book buying, but it's definitely a benefit to both you and us. And if you're able to make a donation, um, we'll put that link in the chat box as well. Um, we really appreciate any support you can give us um, as we try to bring our mission out, bring our mission to life in the world. So without further ado, I would like to welcome my panel. Um, I'm gonna start with Sister Joseph Marie. So Sister is one of the Little Sisters of the Poor in Denver. Um, we are going to have a different one of the Little Sisters participating each week, so we'll get kind of a different perspective, but I will let her tell you a little bit more about herself um, and just kind of where she's at, and um, then each of the panelists will introduce themselves briefly, and we will get started. Good morning or good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sister Joseph Maria, Little Sister of the Poor. I am um, presently in Denver, Colorado, but I've been in uh, Colombia, South America, um, Spain, France. Every little sister goes to France to make our final vows. And our congregation is, uh, the apostolate is caring for the elderly poor who we care for until the moment of death. So we're there at the, um, the precious moment when they're getting ready to encounter our Lord. And um, I also was in Peru and I'm originally from Denver. So this is really home for me. And um, thank you so much. And it'll be great to um, have the other little sisters participate in this study also. We have homes all over the world. Thank you and God bless you. Thank you, sister. Um, Annette, you sort of introduced yourself already. Um, so I'm gonna jump to Jeanette. Hey everyone, I'm Jeanette Chavez. I'm also in Denver and I am in Dow's uh, National Coordinator for Magnifica. Magnifica is in Dow's Apostolate for the Hispanic Community. Thank you, Jeanette. Laura. My name is Laura Zambrana. I'm happy to be here today. I'm, I'm the Director of Content here at Endow. Um, so I've been with Endow as a host for about 10 years and then on the team for the last three. Um, I'm a mother of three and I'm really excited to actually get to hear these words proclaimed aloud. We worked really hard on the study for you guys. Um, so we're excited to bring it to life. All right, without further ado, let's jump in. Um, sister, could you open for us in prayer? Yes. Everyone, when you order the study, you receive a prayer card with your study. Um, it looks like this, and it has our prayer for priests on the back. We, as in now, especially um, feel called to pray for and support our priests. So we're going to begin with that prayer, if you don't mind, sister. Okay. A prayer for priests. Gracious and loving God. I'm sorry, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Gracious and loving God, we thank you for the gift of our priests. Through them, we experience your presence in the sacraments. Help our priests to be strong in their vocation. Set their souls on fire with love for your people. Grant them the wisdom, understanding, and strength they need to follow in the footsteps of Jesus. Inspire them with the vision of your kingdom. Give them the words they need to spread the gospel. Allow them to experience joy in their ministry. Help them to become instruments of your divine grace. We ask this through Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns as our eternal priest. Amen. Father and Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, sister. All right, Annette. All right, so we are going to start um, chapter one, Catholic social teaching from the beginning on page three in your study guide, um, from Eden to the Messiah. In our study of Catholic social teaching, we are going to start at the beginning of God's revelation of himself to his creation. 
There is great significance in rooting Catholic social teaching in a historical context. This is not a teaching that simply arose out of nowhere in the 19th and 20th centuries. Scripture and tradition act as guides to our knowledge of God and ourselves. How we relate to God, one another in society and ourselves is key for understanding what Catholic social teaching means. In this first chapter, we will dive into the creation, fall and redemption of man. Then we will look at how Moses and Mary act as icons for us as we begin this study following the historical development of Catholic social teaching. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. And God saw everything that he had made and behold, it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning, a sixth day from Genesis chapter one. In the beginning, we were in communion with creator and creature alike. The garden in the first chapter of Genesis was an icon of peace and fruitfulness. God saw everything that he had made and behold, it was very good. Everything created, every created thing was ordered to this goodness and humanity was given a particular place in the ordering of creation, which puts Adam and Eve in direct contact with God and gave them stewardship of all the other creatures in God's good and perfect plan. This is the beginning of social doctrine where we see the paradigm of rightly ordered relationship and what we will forever strive to regain after the fall. It's hard to imagine a world where no one was hungry or forgotten or marginalized. It's hard to imagine a place where marriage was perfectly ordered in the plan of creation to bring man closer to woman and to God, woman to man and to God. And it's hard to imagine a world where creation was not simply an object of use, but a home full of all that was needed and good for everyone's thriving. Where everyone and everything was in loving relationship, where all was good. Yet this was the world God created and willed for us. Then sin entered the world. By listening to the serpent and eating of the tree that was forbidden, Adam and Eve ruptured their relationship with both God and their fellow creatures. They were naked and ashamed, banished from the garden. They must now struggle and strive for what was lost, the harmony of the living in perfect communion with God and with each other. The timeline of the Old Testament reveals the story of suffering and healing over and over, the great flood of Noah and God's promise to never again to destroy the earth, the nomadic family of Abraham settling in the land that God shows them and Abraham's subsequent test of faithfulness as he goes to sacrifice his son Isaac, the 12 sons of Jacob and their treatment of Joseph. Later, the right right-hand man to Pharaoh and his forgiveness of his brother's cruelty. The children of Israel vacillate endlessly between faithfulness and faithlessness, always falling back on the great mercy of God and the call to return to their creator and then falling again. Then several generations later, an Israelite baby is born and hidden in the reeds during a time of terrible persecution and slavery. His name is Moses, and he grows up in the courts of Pharaoh, having been rescued from the river by Pharaoh's daughter. God uses this unlikely hero as his spokesman, calling him from his life as a shepherd to be the liberator of God's people. 
I have seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmaster. I know their sufferings and I have come down to deliver them out of the land of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey. Moses leads God's people out of slavery and injustice into freedom. Though they wander for 40 years before coming to the promised land, they are given everything they need daily according to God's providence. This is the great exodus, remembered yearly in the Passover celebration held by the Jewish people throughout the world to this day. And it is with Moses that we see God's law codified and written down for the people of Israel, literally in stone, as the Ten Commandments. This is the path to life that God lays down for his people whom he loves. He is giving them the way to restore relationship with him and with one another. And God spoke all these words saying, I'm the Lord, your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You have no other God, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not take the name of the Lord, your God in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Honor your father and your mother. You shall not kill, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor, you shall not covet your neighbor's house, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, nor his manservant or his maidservant or his ox or his donkey or anything that is your neighbor's. From Exodus chapter 20. We see in the Ten Commandments not only imperatives living in peace with one's neighbor and one's community, but directives for family life and simple practical ways to live in harmony with God. It is truly a first social doctrine of the Jewish people, the old covenant that later carries over into the new covenant in the person of Christ. Throughout the stories of Israel, of Israelite kings and prophets, it is the Messiah that God's people await. He is foreshadowed in the person of Moses, the great liberator, and is foretold throughout the scriptures, the hope for king who will free the Israelites from all the suffering and difficulties they face, from their own sin and selfishness, to the Babylonian exile from Jerusalem and the Roman occupation many generations later. When the Messiah does come as a tiny baby in a small town born to a young girl, they are not ready for him. There is literally no room in the inn. There it is only shepherds and foreign kings who come to bow down. His own Jewish ruler tries to murder him. His family become refugees in Egypt in order to save his life. There is no recognition that this could possibly be the one foretold by the prophets. How could God come to them to save them as a vulnerable child without wealth or pedigree? Surely he would be born among royalty, or at the very least, he would come from a well-known powerful family. Yet this shoot of, dress, uh, this shoot of Jesse does in fact spring from the line of David, the house of kings. And for those with open hearts, Mary, Joseph, Simeon, Elizabeth, he is the fulfillment of all they have longed for. This was how God chose to bring about the restoration of the natural order, ruptured and distorted by sin and human greed. The father hears the cries of his people and in his great plan of salvation, gives to us the incarnation. It is Christ's very life that reveals the fullness of justice, the totality of charity, complete solidarity. He suffers with those who have been forgotten and he lives and preaches among those who need him most, the sinners, the prostitutes, the tax collectors, the working poor, they, in fact, are the ones with eyes to see and ears to hear, and his message spreads. At the foot of the cross, we see a perfect image of God's plan of social restoration and healing. As Mary stands beneath her suffering son, Jesus says to John, Behold your mother. And to Mary, he says, Behold your son. In this way, he gives all of humanity to the perfect love 
and care of his own mother. And he offers to us a way to understand our own place in the plan of salvation. Like Mary, we are called to take on the suffering of others. In her pain, she did not stay closed up and grief stricken, but turned to John and cared for his suffering with a mother's love. We are to expand our notion of family and embrace those around us who are hurting and abandoned. We receive the abundance of God, mercy and love at the cross, the privilege to call God Abba and Mary our own mother. But if we stop there, we miss the point that restoring us as children of God gives us back our place in the garden to care for one another and to steward God's creation as he intended. Through Christ, we can again live in right relationship with one another, God and all creation, as it was meant to be in the beginning. Discussion questions. What, is the, what was distinct about life in the Garden of Eden that fundamentally shifted with the coming of sin? How did this rupture affect creation, marriage, and our relationship with God? Two, go over the Ten Commandments again. How did these lay out a social doctrine for the children of Israel? Which ones strike you most? Three, with the incarnation, what is newly revealed about God with regard to social doctrine? Panel. I'm going to open up this first discussion to you. Um, ladies in the audience, if you have comments or questions on these questions, please put them in the chat box to endow. Um, and we can um, we'll circle back around at the end to those questions. So just know we aren't forgetting you if we don't get to them right now. Um, we'll get kind of wrap it all together at the end of our discussion. Um, but for now, just the panelists are I would love to hear your comments. Um, I guess the distinct part, what was distinct um, is on that first page um, where we see the paradigm of rightly ordered relationship. So what was distinct about Eden is that there wasn't all this drama and tension and anxiety and war. And, you know, there's like much like the peacefulness seems to be distinct um and then yeah that line from genesis and god saw everything he had made and behold it was very good um that seems very distinct because it's hard i can see god now looking at all of us and being and being like hopeful and knowing that he's bringing us like back to him but i think now if god when god looks around like i think that like you know his sacred heart is like bleeding you know like in pain for all the suffering in the world so um that's what's distinct or what I see as distinct about life in Garden of Eden. Yes, I, I agree with you, Laura. When I was reading the passage, uh, the thing that struck me about the garden was it seemed like um, God and Adam and Eve were all kind of in solidarity in wishing the best for each other and wishing um, kind of like the... they were all seeking the good of the other as much as they were seeking their own good, it seemed. And with the fall, then they became very selfish thinking about what do I need? What do I want? And how does what I need? And if, 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 if I seek the wool, the, the best for another, does that mean I get less because, you know, whatever they get, I don't get. And it seems like we lost that ability to will the best for each other because we see that best as kind of a limited commodity. So whatever someone else gets, I won't get. And um, I feel like that was probably one of the, the biggest tragedies and leads to so much conflict and leads to so much, um, yeah, so much uh, pain. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. I agree with um, both of you and where it says where um, everything was in loving relationship. God always wants the good of, of everything, yet we mingle it, 
get ourselves mixed up and due to our um, egotisticalness and, and self-centeredness, we turn that into bad. And so the, there was that loving relationship where everything was, everyone was loving e each other and um, everything was good. We saw it good. We didn't um, criticize, uh, you know, not looking at, at others, but looking at the good in them. And I would also like to add on to that question, how did this rupture affect us? Um, besides bringing a lot of pride and security, division, lack of trust, uh, mainly affecting our relationship with, with God, God our Father, God the Provider. Um, I don't know about uh, you all, but in my relationship uh, with the Lord, uh, my constant prayer is to, to restore that image of God the Father, uh, mm -hmm. to, to trust and not to relate that relationship, perhaps, that I have with my own Father, uh, with Him. But, but more to, it's an invitation for, for me to surrender um, to his love. And through this constant, um, what would you say, healing of the relationship, renewal of the relationship of trusting God as my father, as a provider, that I can sl slowly restore my own um, relationship with him. That's beautiful. I noticed uh, in that last paragraph, uh, the privilege to call God Abba, mm -hmm. you know, but like Jesus gives us this permission that I think is sometimes depending again, everyone's different journey, but it is hard to imagine like God, you know, you're really like the creator, all the, you know, um, to realize like the, uh, like we can call him Abba. Um, like, yeah, daddy, you know, is, um, is very, yeah, it's very convicting. And I love, um, Jeanette, like your call to like prayer. I feel like Jeanette's always like, do your doctrine guys, but then pray about it, <laughs> which is so helpful and so wonderful. So thank you, Jeanette. No, I agree. I love how you always make it personal. Um, you know, I, I tend to focus on relationships with others and um, interactions with, with my family and with, um, my community and try to find ways to resolve and, and restore the peace there. But ultimately and fundamentally, we have to restore the peace and relationship with our father. Um, and if we can do that successfully, I think those other relationships will follow in kind. So thank you for that. I love the part where you said trust, trust in God. And that's what our vocation as little sisters is. We trust in divine providence for anything we need. And um, there's a saying that our mother foundress said, she says, when you're tired and weak and you just feel really overburdened, go to the chapel and tell our Lord, he has an excellent memory. So you don't even have to tell him anything. He's just there to listen to you, to be that presence. Just like John Paul II said, you know, when you're praying, you don't have to say anything. It's that prayer, that presence of prayer that connects you to, to Jesus, which um, brings up that trust. And we're in the year of St. Joseph, so he's our patron. So whatever we need, we confide to him, um, spiritually, physically, whatever. He is always there for us, just like for anyone. You know, he's our father. I love that. Um, I also, I keep coming to the second question and thinking um, that, I, I don't know, I guess the, the idea of like, okay, right relationship, like what I'm always like, what does that mean kind of person? Um, and I, when I first read this and read the question, thinking, like, oh, this is a study about Catholic social teaching. Like, I know the seven principles of Catholic social teaching. I know the four themes, you know, whatever. I know all of those like theological breakdowns, right? But then you, they throw around words like 
subsidiarity and solidarity and the preferential option for the poor and things like that. And you're like, okay, like, again, nice, but like, what does that mean? And I just love how much, like how basic it is to go back to scripture and to say, actually, the first social doctrine, like we, we screwed it up in the Garden of Eden, but then we, we received this gift of the Ten Commandments, which like we all learn as children, right? Like we teach that, we learn that as, in catechism class of like, these are like the basic rules for what it means to be in right relationship with another person and with God. Um, and that, that, I mean, like it's, you read them over again and you're like, yeah, that is like, it's hard, oh, you need, yeah, but I it's classic. basic. Like, don't lie, don't steal, give God first place. Like these basic things that you're like, oh, okay. Like that's not, it, it's hard. <laughs> like not that it's not difficult to do, but like to go back and say, this is the, the foundation of Catholic social teaching is I just feel like so important to remind all of us because really most of us are just dealing with our families and our neighbors and our coworkers. And yes, we may do some things with a broader community or kind of this idea of the poor, like, I don't mean that, that, that like the poor who are out there kind of thing. Um, and so it seems like Catholic social teaching isn't part of our daily lives, but that this kind of brings it back to, oh wait, no, it is like this, this social teaching is part of my life as a mother and a neighbor and a, and a, and a working person. Um, and that, that, I don't know, it just really struck me kind of opening this up and got me really excited to open this up and say like, this isn't just theology that I do, you know, like it's not just the nerdy thing that I geek out on. It's this, this part of my life that for this, this thing that helps me to live as a better person um, and to live those relationships and, and actually tells me positive things about how I can do that. Um, right. It's like both like incredibly practical. Like sometimes I think like the most theological is actually like also the most practical. Like God is Trinity. Other priests are like, I can't preach about the Trinity. Like, well, you're not like, suppose, like, you're not, <laughs> no one's asking you for a treatise, okay? We're just asking you to talk to us about how God is fundamentally in relationship. Like, God is love. And like, what that, act, you know, we don't need to freak out about Trinity is hard. We can actually like invite, you know, hard things and actually help us to pray better and to think through, like Jeanette said, like, how do I, how do I understand God as Father, God as Son, God as Holy Spirit? It doesn't have to be this like untouchable too hard for the average person thing. And I think, um, I think I was laughing today reading, uh, Teresa assigned us our reading portion. So it was really funny to read the 10 commandments. Well, I think it's one of those things that you hear the term 10 commandments and you're like, oh yeah, I know that and you move on. But then you actually like read the list and you're like, oh, like I haven't really like thought about the actual pieces in a long time. And like you said, Teresa, like it really is like the roadmap to happiness. <laughs> It's like, put God first, take your rest, watch your language. You know, like it's much more like honor your mom and dad, you know, like don't be all covetous and not wanting what you, not having gratitude for what you already have. Like it really is like a recipe for happiness. And yeah. so I used to think of the commandments more in the, like the God, you know, the, all the movies, you know. The, the fire and the mountain and you know just like the intensity of the Ten Commandments um which is still true and good but I think that more to the reality it's a father's being like hey you need this this will bring help this will really help you and I love you and I want you to be happy um you know less Charlton Heston smashing and more like <laughs> more which we watched this year and my kids loved but anyways um but more like a father like inviting inviting his kids back like this is what you need to know this is what happiness looks like um so I found it very convicting to read through and and like for the prayer portion that Jeanette was bringing us to I felt called to pray through the Ten Commandments again just like actually reading them through and thinking through like what are where is God and where is God calling me inviting me to like lean more into which which of these of these ten 
I like how the book mentions that our first social doctrine is to live in harmony with God. Like how simple and direct is that? Yes, that's so true. It really, it's simple. It's difficult, like you said, Teresa, but it's simple. Um, and what struck me when I was reading the Ten Commandments is that back to my idea of what it was like in the garden when everyone sought the good of the other. If you're truly seeking the good of the other, you would never break any of these because all of the um, offenses of the 10 commandments tend to be when we're putting ourselves ahead of others or when we're thinking primarily of ourselves, you know, particular, particularly in coveting, you would never covet if you willed the good of the other. And that's kind of what, um, what I've been reflecting on a lot and thinking that that could make a substantial difference um, in my life and in, in my communities. If, if everyone kind of thought of what's best for everyone else and not just what's best for, for me personally. Right. Yeah, I love that pointing out. And I'm remembering something that I spelled it. I mean, it's Father Mike Schmidt's Bible in a Year podcast. Amazing. Um, are, you, are you still doing it? I mean, I'm like going to finish in five years, but yeah. That's fine. But you're like <laughs> part of your regular. Oh, that's so awesome. Yeah, no, that's incredible, incredible work he's doing. It will take me five years to get through it all, but like we're, we're doing our, our own pacing. Uh, but something he said about the time is when he was talking about it was he was like, this is these don't just come out of nowhere. Like it's not just God doesn't start with the rules. He doesn't start with this is what you do or don't do. He starts with a relationship and taking them out of Egypt and delivering them from slavery. And so he builds the relationship first and then kind of gives them the the roadmap um, and that. They struggle with it still, obviously, um, but the, that idea of relationship, I mean, and it's, it's written into those Ten Commandments that the relationship comes first uh, before the moral action. So uh, I just thought that was very interesting. Um, we do, unfortunately, have to move on in order to get through things. Um, this is where I point out section two and say, read it. It's really good. Uh, but we don't have time to read it. Um, uh, I do love, it goes more into depth as, uh, about Moses as a figure of and model for Catholic social teaching. One thing that particularly struck me this time reading through it, which I thought was really beautiful, um, was the idea of Moses having two mothers, um, that he was raised by both Pharaoh's, Pharaoh's daughter and um, and by his own his own birth mother, um, and that idea of adoption and spiritual adoption, and you know, just the idea of then we we jump into section three, which is about Mary, um, and how Mary is a spiritual mother to all of us. I just thought was really a beautiful kind of witness to the feminine genius in particular, and the role of the feminine in in scripture. Um, so I encourage you, please go back and read section two. Um, and we, but today we will jump into section one. And Matt, if you could get us started. Okay, hey, now we're on section three, which is on page okay. 11 in the study guide. Uh, and it's, the title is Mary has the icon. In the sixth month, and this is from uh, the Gospel of Luke. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Hail, full of grace, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and considered in her mind what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom, there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, how can this be since I have no husband? 
And the angel said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your kinswoman Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. For with God, nothing will be impossible. And Mary said, Behold, I am the handmaid of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. 1300 years later, Israel is now occupied by the Roman Empire. The emperor Caesar Augustus and the Roman Senate have put Herod in power as the Jewish king. And in the small town of Nazareth, about 90 miles from Jerusalem, lives a young girl who will again change salvation history forever. In Mary, we find another unlikely heroine, a Hebrew girl of about 14 years of age who is betrothed to a carpenter named Joseph. There doesn't seem to be anything remarkable about her at all. To her, the Archangel Gabriel comes and we can only imagine the Im immensity of Mary's shock. To be told all at once that you are going to have a baby by the power of the Holy Spirit, therefore making him the Son of God. These words must have taken more than a moment to sink in, but Mary quickly responds, let it be done to me according to your word. She knew the Lord and was prepared to say yes, even if she didn't fully understand. Is it my turn? Sorry. Yeah. As women, we can understand Mary's plight and our hearts go out to her. What will Joseph say? What will her mother say? What will the neighbors say? We don't know if any of these thoughts entered Mary's mind. We do know she... We do know that she pondered, she wondered, and in God's great mercy, she's given a choice. She can say no to this call, this divine invitation to turn her life upside down for the sake of God's people and the liberation of all. But she doesn't. She says yes, and her fiat, her great act of faith to trust in the providence of God to be with her and provide all she will need to be his mother changes everything. In Mary, we see the welcoming of a new covenant, Emmanuel. God with us. God decisively enters human history. Keep going, sorry. One of the most beautiful elements of Mary's story is the way she both receives those sent to her, such as the angel, the shepherds, and the magi, and the way she goes to those who need her, her cousin Elizabeth, Jesus on the road to Calvary, John at the foot of the cross. She is able to see suffering and act. She is able to provide both spiritual and physical hospitality. Because she is immaculate conceived, she is able to act in perfect freedom and complete love. This does not mean that Mary does not face temptation and suffering, but her response is devoid of selfishness and fear. She says yes to God's call over and over again without the ego or the stain of sin getting in the way. This helps us to understand what we as a human community can strive for, the kind of freedom that only God can give. Her Magnifica, the prayer that bursts forth upon Elizabeth's recognition of God's presence in Mary is for us as Christians, the most humble and complete cry of humanity to God. It is a kind of social doctrine, prayer of supplication, and song of praise rolled into one. Of this prayer, Pope St. John Paul II writes that the awareness that the truth about God who saves us, the truth about God who is the source of every gift cannot be separated from the manifestation of his love of preference for the poor and humble. That love which celebrated in the Magnificat is later expressed in the words and works of Jesus. Mary's words for us as women are powerful and timeless. She truly is blessed among women. 
She speaks to our lowliness, our blessedness, God's mercy, God's preference for the poor and humble, the hungry, the faithful. It is to her we look as we seek to know what the new covenant of Christ's incarnation means for humanity. We move from a people of God, instructed and guided by the mouthpieces of God, the prophets, the liberators, to the children of God, called into an intimate relationship with the creator and his son, Jesus. We are no longer slaves, but friends. All questions of restoring the natural order, the family, the societies around us, must flow from this posture of intimacy that Mary models for us. As we journey through this study on the historical development of Catholic social teaching, Mary will remain our touchstone, our icon for what it means to live in right relationship restored through the incarnation. Come Holy Spirit, let us renew the face of the earth. Discussion questions. So for this, the panel will discuss for about probably five minutes, and then we'll open it up to comments from, we'd love to hear everyone's comments. So um, keep that in mind as I read through these and kind of think about what's striking you um, in these questions. The first question is, does Mary have a choice when God calls her? How is her yes to God different than ours? How is it the same? Two, how does Mary redefine the way God interacts with his people? How is she the Ark of the Covenant? Three, in what ways can we especially relate to Mary as women? How is she a particular model for us in terms of relationship? What struck you, ladies? I think Mary does. She did have a choice to either say yes or no. She has a free will, just like we do. And her fiat was repeated. And our yes to God in whatever vocation he's called us, um, married life, the, whatever we do, we have that possibility of saying yes to God every day through the actions that we do. If they're positive, then that's our way of saying yes. If they're negative, then we're um, not accepting the grace that God is inviting us to receive. And um, we meet myself as a little stir of the poor. Um, our vocation is a mystery. It's a gift from God and I have to renew it daily because my perseverance isn't fulfilled. It's a daily, daily saying yes to God to be able to perse persevere despite the, the turmoils, the, the sacrifices, the inconveniences. We have to deal with um, our li ourselves in community. You know, we're human nature and life is not a bed of roses. So we accept each other with our um, differences, our, uh, super, our um, lacking of, of gifts. Uh, we accept each other for who we are. And it is through this acceptance we, um, we mature and yet we, the gift of God becomes purer. And also in our relationship with the elderly, you know, sometimes the elderly uh, repeat the same thing over and over, but yet it is that patience, just like uh, you mothers with your kids, you know, mommy, can I have this? Can I have that? You know, I didn't get this. And so it's that patience in that realm and that love, trusting that sharing that love will help them to radiate it to others. And then with our employees, well, it's um, constant. You know, 
we they have to be imbued with our spirit in order to give it to to the old people, to our residents, to anyone whom they come in contact. The family members sometimes are, you know, very trying. Like in this situation, you know, the, the lockdown, they don't understand. Uh, some do, some want the betterment for their, their loved ones, but yet they wanna see their loved ones. And so that's hard because we love the residents, we wanna protect them. And so it's a sacrifice and um, I'm the beggar. So it was a really sacrifice not to go out into the community and beg for our resources. In every home, there's two little sisters that go out begging and Providence is always there. So we couldn't go out and see our donors but they wanted us to go. So our driver would go and pick up the, the donations but now at least we're able to go out and eventually go out to the, to the parishes to at least uh, have that presence, that presence because we love our donors and it's a way of thanking them. So that yes is repeated daily, daily. And the only way we can say it with our whole heart is through our contact in prayer with God. Um, I love that what you kind of just said, hang on, I got to, I got to write it down, I'm going to forget it. Um, what you just said about like asking for, basically, another way of saying it's asking for help is way of thanking them. I think that is so Marian and very countercultural because no one, not nobody, maybe, the, maybe there's saints on this call, probably, but like actually asking for help, I find like very hard and like that what you kind of just challenged us to is like actually asking for help and acknowledging our littleness, like our lady is actually a way of saying thank you to them and thank you to God for putting us in community together. It's not like living out Catholic social teaching isn't like, oh, look at me. I know subsidiarity. I'm going to go subsidize. You know, like it's not actually like this active, active thing. It's an action that comes out of contemplation, out of prayer. And unless we actually know our littleness in front of God, we're not going to be as effective as we could be if we actually get things back in the right in the right relationship. Um, so thank you, sister. That was very helpful. So thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and I would also like to highlight the feminine genius of uh, Mother Mary. And I think in her relationship with God, um, she was free. She had that freedom to, to answer with her fiat. Um, she didn't really understand it, but she saw a need and acted. And um, she acted um, with trust in the Lord and with that knowledge that she had of God, of who he was. She didn't understand what was happening, but she just knew that she had to act and say yes. And I would also like to invite everyone to really dive into section two, the section that we didn't um, read, because to me, uh, the feminine genius of the women here, when it talks about uh, Moses's mother, his sister, and um, the, the princess, um, yeah, the Egyptian princess, how their feminine genius is fully just playing out um, one, you know, Moses's mother is in need, in need of someone to come save her son. So she acts, um, you know, hopeful that someone will find her son in the river. But what really struck me was the sister that she's just kind of guarding him on the sideline, just praying, knowing that the right person's going to pick him up and and then the princess acts. She doesn't see the, she, she puts aside her role as the princess and just puts her feminine genius, her, her motherhood, her spiritual motherhood into play and just picks up this baby in, and takes care of it. Um, but I just saw how interesting that is. You know, as a mother, we, we pray for our children that someone else will come and and be that princess to pick them up and help them. Um, but just how each person is 
call differently and just how I, but that the sister is the one that really struck me the most. I also pictured her as mother Mary, always praying and interceding for the right woman to come in and act. And once that woman acts, this baby Moses or whoever we are being called to help is going to be able to live their God-given mission. So I really invite you all to read that section. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, and that you're muted. Thanks, Jeanette, for sharing that. That's so beautiful. Um, I love that reflection about the about the women, and and I love reflecting on the fact that um, that the women in the gospel stories are so key, so fundamental to you know God being able to to act in the world. Um, and in relation to question two, how does Mary redefine the way God interacts with his people? With Mary, God sent the angel Gabriel into dialogue with her, into a direct ask, will you do this for me that she responded to? And because this happened with Mary, now it's a thing, like this is the way God interacts with his people. So when we have a calling or we feel a calling or we hear the voice of God, even if it's not audible, if it's you know in our mind or in our heart or in our soul, that's a thing. That's how God operates. We've seen it happen in scripture over and over. So there's no reason to think that he wouldn't do that with us. And that's kind of a new way that God and humanity are in relation, coming back into relation, maybe not fully restored to the way it was in the garden, but definitely a step in that direction. Well, and I love the idea of her as Mary as the Ark of the Covenant and that idea of she is the way in which God is brought to the world, the way in which she is the the, the touchstone um, and the the how people can come to see his work here is through her um, and through kind of each of us then become the the touchstone uh, as through the Eucharist right is that we kind of know the end of the story but that she was the first one who really showed us how God is within physically and spiritually is within her and can be within each of us and working then working in the world and in our relationship um, and that, that image is just so powerful when we think about how we when we think about talking to another person that we can be talking as the ark of the covenant or we can be talking as ourselves right like that we can be we can be we can be conveying christ to the world or we can not um, even like but the, even like in like how we hold ourselves or how we like inter like how we see people cutting us off in traffic like yeah. is that person like another child of god or aren't they and like it's again shocking sometimes how you go throughout the day seeing people as like other and not like part of your family you're like oh this person who cut me off is actually part of God's family or this person in the line who didn't bring their grocery bags or what, you know, all the normal daily things. Um, they're actually, that immediate thing has to be like this. I'm part of their, we are, we are part of the same family um, because you're actually aware of Christ who formed you and who formed that person to be in the same community. Um, but I think it's like very, I love, yeah, I love the, the visual of, of Mary, both like as active and as contemplative, you know, that she goes out to help people and they also, she also receives them well. So I think like that is a call for each of us. Like how do we act and how do we like receive? I think I, um, I like the fact that um, what you brought up about Mary, like um, she was the first tabernacle. She was the first person who carried Jesus in her womb. So I love that image where she's the first tabernacle. When you go into uh, have exposition, you think of Mary 
holding Jesus. Right? It gives it gives her another uh, another it just it's just another image and it helps make I feel like it helps make both the Eucharist more real um, and make her more real as the like you are the mother, but the mother of God and what that means for our faith and what that means for our understanding of of the Eucharist. Um, I do want to invite questions from Now's your chance. Um, you feel free to either raise your hand or write into the chat box um, and any comments or questions that you may have. Um, we'd love to hear from you at this point. Uh, That's right. If you don't have a question, but you um, have a comment to what either the discussion questions or anything that was shared or anything that we read, we'd love to hear from you. We have a shy group. I have two <laughs> other things to point out while people are, you know. Go for it, Laura. This is so, scanning comments. I love the comments in the general chat, but I'm not able to keep up with them as we're also talking. So, Laura, um, go for I it. love that part that of John Paul's uh, quote about how the Magnificat is later expressed in the works and words of Jesus. I've never thought about, you know, like, We'll pray it at the end, but like my soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord. How he, you know, I think that I love personally, love the Midfikat. So, haha, it's at the end of every chapter. Um, but I think it's such a, like a beautiful, like, you know, like to again think through who God is. Um, but I've never thought about it before with how it fits together with um, Jesus is the fulfillment of those words. Like, I think that's such an interesting thing again to think about and pray about. If I'm Janeth, I'm going to pray about it. If I'm Laura, I'm going to think about it, but now with Janess' help in my community as a coworker, I'm going to pray about it. Um, so that's one thing I wanted to point out. And then, sorry, okay, I'm going to pause. Is somebody ready to talk? <laughs> yeah, and if you, um, if you don't know how to raise your hand, there should be a button at the bottom of your Zoom, which it says reactions, where you can either clap or send a heart. And there's also a bar that says, raise your hand. So if you have a comment that you would like to share with us, please do. And we'll, um, Kelsey will find you and spotlight you for our, for our community. All right, so next week, I can't wait for all these people to be brave. Okay, my other comment. All right, it's the introduction, um, so we don't have a lot of questions right now. I'm, that's what I'm going with, but save your questions, or don't save your questions. If you have them now, ask them now. But um, next week, other, we're gonna dive in. My other uh, thing to throw out there um, is the historical thing that like Mary, the incarnation and Mary is that like God enters history. It is like a, a mark, like it's no longer like, you know, just the Jewish people or just this thing from, it's like a very decisive thing. Um, and um, I think that there's a way in which like we are part of this history. Like we're gonna go through, you know, the historical development, but like each of us actually saying fiat every day is us like actually inter actually being a part of history like our lives are not just their little little things we're not we're not like part of we're not like on a small stage like everything actually like really matters um so that for me helps with like again the pie in the sky portion of um of history of, of the incarnation where it's like sure incarnation okay cool but then like actually the incarnation is like calling us to like fully act in our full selves today and to be a part of this history, like you're part of chapter nine, you know, the, the, the continuing story, Teresa Hodges, you know, like, um, and I think for me that again, is very convicting that like my life like actually matters. It's not just like, cool, Laura, you did the, 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 this with a good attitude, who cares? It's like, oh no, like this actually like has major ripple effects. Um, so Our Lady with her like 
little yes in that room, again, has like enormous, enormous effects. So history is my other. Well, again, and dovetailing or the flip side of that is like thinking about how God entered history as a specific person, as an individual who just, who had friends um, and who just walked around, walked around Israel. Like he didn't travel the world. He didn't have the internet. He didn't, but he did that on purpose. Like he couldn't reach a, a giant stage. He didn't start a mega church kind of thing. He did it on purpose that he had 12 particular friends and from them three and from them one who he called to help continue his church and then spread his message, right? And that the 12 were sent out and that they also were individuals who didn't have the internet. Right. Um, <laughs> and that it was like word of mouth and individual relationship and that this spread through time and space, like that, that, it, that Jesus is so particular. Is yeah. Like he lived a 24 hour day. Yeah. Yeah. And he, he, he died when he was 33. Like, and he only spoke, he only had public ministry for three years. Like, and that, that, like, sometimes, I don't know, I get overwhelmed thinking about like Catholic social teaching and like those, like the big things, right? Like, or the state of the church kind of thing. The, like, those big questions of culture and society that we like love to talk about but also our, I mean, love to talk about and it's good to think about, but also what we're really called to isn't a big picture thing. What we're called to is living the individual relationships and that that's what we see in the life of Christ, but it's hard to remember that because we have the gospel, right? Like we have this story written down and it's, Sometimes I feel like hard to remember. I think people are talking about the chosen. I do love the chosen for that, like because it humanizes Christ and the apostles. Like it, it, it gives context and like, yeah, they just sat and ate and laughed together. And like that, that's a huge part of Jesus's ministry is just forming friendships. Um, and we don't, we don't always think of that when we think of the gospel story. Um, and like what happened like after dinner at Jesus's house, you know, how like you know, with just like the little, like the little, I heard a podcast recently like asking like to invite Jesus and Mary like to your dinner table. I mean, my dinner table is, you know, it's pretty exciting. There's three little kids under five, there's food on the plates and also all, you know, and so inviting Jesus into that and like that Jesus and Mary want to be part of your dinner table is like mind blowing to me. I'm like, are you sure? I think you want to go up the street where it's a little more neat and tidy. But actually, again, the reality is that like Jesus is human. He wants to be part of our family life. He wants to be part of our work life. He wants to be part of all of it, you know, not just um at church. Like it's actually like in your daily, from the church, like into your daily life, and from your daily life like into the church. Like it's not just where it's tidy and clean. I love that. And sorry, I'm going to have to cut people off so that we are respectful of time um, and can end with prayer. Um, but I think that's a beautiful thing to leave us with while we end with this beautiful prayer that does invite him into our, um, our daily lives. And we invite all of you to come back same time and place next week. Um, and then email Teresa all your hard questions. Yes, all of them. Do it. <laughs> and we'll look forward to either talking about them next week or, you know, me writing a really fun email, which is also entertaining for me. <laughs> Nerdy things I geek out on. Anyway, we're going to end with a closing prayer. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. My soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior, for he has looked with favor on his humble servant. From this day, all generations will call me blessed. The Almighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. He has mercy on those who fear him in every generation. He has shown the strength of his arm. He has scattered the proud in their conceit. He has cast down the mighty from their thrones and has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. He has come to the help of his servant Israel. For he has remembered his promise of mercy, the promise he made to our fathers, to Abraham and his children forever. 
Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We hope to see you next week. Yes. Thank you, ladies.